Hello and welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, Pressurized, a short, punchy version of our main feed that gets right to the scientific point. If you like what you hear, you'd like to hear the full episode, you can find it in the same feed. And now, to get right to the point. So, anyone following the news recently might have seen there was uh, the deepest, deepest hole dug in the seabed. This turned out to be a, an interesting legacy that's been going on since about the 1970s, the quest for the moho. The hole that would give us mantle rock from below the Earth's crust, basically, to, to penetrate the Earth's crust. And yeah, it, it's happened a few times with this particular expedition, Expedition 399, Building Blocks of Life, got in there. So I'm going to have a chat with Dr. Andrew McKay, one of the co-PIs on this recent drilling trip. I'm joined by Dr. Andrew McCaig, Associate Professor at the University of Leeds in the UK, and his research focuses on the structural geology, tectonics, and geochemistry. He was recently the co-chief scientist of the IODP Expedition 399, Building Blocks of Life, Atlantis Massif, that sailed between April and June 2023. It's mantle rocks which have been exposed on the seafloor that we drilled into, and they've been exposed there by faulting. But the previous record was 200 point nine meters and we did 1268 meters so we exceeded the previous record for drilling into mantle rocks by more than five times so that was the that was the achievement and it means we've got very continuous what we're recovering we're we're recovering a drill core here it's about uh, six and a half centimeters in diameter and uh, what we got is very continuous sections of drill core so that the scientists can look at that in in great detail as we move forward with post-cruise research. And by getting sort of deeper into the mantle rock, I'm guessing exposed mantle rock has sort of started to change, started to be impacted, started reacting with the seawater. Is this sort of a, a, a purer example of what's going on inside the planet? Well, it's deep inside the planet that the mantle rocks are not reacting with water Uh, certainly in the way that they are doing here. So the mantle is made of pridotite rock, and pridotite is the main mineral in that is olivine. And uh, typical mantle rocks are maybe uh, 70% olivine. And at depth, if you're, you know, let's say down at 50 kilometers or or something, that's very hot. And the only place where water gets down to that depth is in subduction zones. But we're at at the mid-Atlantic ridge where basically the water can only go down maybe a few kilometers. So what happens when these mantle rocks get exposed on the seafloor is that the water can get at them really easily. And the, the mineral olivine alters to the mineral serpentine. And serpentine, you can think of it as a hydrated version of olivine. It's got more or less the same magnesium and iron and and silica in it, but it's got water added to it. And that process of serpentinization is really interesting because in that process, what you have is the olivine mineral has about 10% of an iron-rich M member. And that iron is in the 2 plus state, SEPI 2 plus. But when the change is serpentine, the serpentine can't hold all that iron and so it throws that iron out. And what that does is it changes into magnetite. Now, magnetite is a mineral which contains both Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. So what you have here is a redox reaction. So you oxidize the iron from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, and you need to reduce something else. So you reduce seawater from H2O to H2. So this process generates hydrogen gas. And that hydrogen gas is then what we would call in our expedition, though some people might dispute this, the first building block of life. And then that hydrogen gas can combine with carbon dioxide, which may be either from the ocean or it may be deep-seated carbon dioxide coming from deep in the Earth, because the Earth is degassing a certain amount of carbon dioxide all the time. So reaction between carbon dioxide, CO2, and hydrogen, H2, makes CH4, which is methane, we're all familiar with methane. That's what we burn on our cookers still at the moment in order to cook our food if we have a gas cooker. So that's methane. Now, most methane in the world is generated by biological processes, by animals. You know, we, we've all heard about this in the context of climate change, that cows and sheep are eating grass and generating methane, and that methane is contributing to global warming. And this is the normal way it happens. But here, what we're seeing in, in the spentinization is you're making methane by abiotic processes, by processes that don't require any microbes or that sort of activity. And then what we see as well is we see higher organic molecules like formic acid and acetic acid. So these have now a carboxylal grip. So now the methane is combining with more water and so on. It's making more complicated molecules. And then finally, in the Atlantis Massif, previous workers have detected some amino acids, tryptophan, which is an amino acid. 
Now, this isn't one of the amino acids that's in DNA, but if you can make amino acids without any biological activity, then this is what you need to do in order to, before you can possibly have life, uh, if we believe in the evolutionary version of the origin of life. So uh, people are very interested in spentanization, and they're not just people who work on rocks in the Atlantic Ocean, people who work on the icy moons like Enceladus and uh, Europa and so on. These moons have got icy surfaces and water underneath the ice, and underneath that water is the same stuff as the Earth's mantle. We know from meteorites that most meteorites are made of essentially mantle rocks. They're the breaking up of planetary bodies which are similar to Earth. And, and so the speculation is that just as microbial life might have evolved in places like the Atlantis Massif, where seawater can interact with olivine-rich rocks, that the same thing might have been and might indeed be happening on icy worlds out in the solar system. So it is, it's a very interesting place, the Atlantis Massif, for astrobiology as well as for marine geology. Looking down to look up. Indeed. But the other interesting thing about our hull is that uh, we also had on the, on the ship four microbiologists, and uh, the microbiologists were... Uh, collected a whole set of samples every five metres or so down this hole for, for 1,280 metres, they got a sample. And those samples, we think that the bottom of the hole now will be probably at more than 120 degrees. I mean, at the moment, what we've got is some temperature measurements in the hole, which go up to just over 90 degrees. But just before we'd done that, we'd flushed cold water into it for an extended period. So the, the temperature was warming up in, in, in over a period of hours. And we think that in a few years, we'll be able to go back and measure the temperature and probably be above 120 at the bottom of the hole, which is above the current limit for life. So potentially the microbiologists have got samples in these spentanized rocks where they find archaea bacteria, uh, microbes and things like that, ancient looking microbes in terms of their longevity. And they can constrain what's going on in the rocks over that temperature gradient, which would be really exciting. Of course, we don't have any of that data yet. Yeah, it's always frustrating. Everyone wants the wants the results when you come back to shore, but it's like, yeah, that's, that's a year, two years away, maybe. <laughs> There's a lot of work to be done. Exactly. This is very close to an area we've discussed in the past. The the Atlantis Massif is is kind of next door to the Lost City. Uh, is that It's the same process is going on there, isn't it? Exactly. So the Lost City hydrothermal field is on the top of the Atlantis Massif, and it's only 800 metres away from the deep hole we drilled in spent tonight. So we're drilling into the substrate of Lost City. So, you know, what's underneath Lost City, what the fluid, the fluid's coming out of Lost City at more than 100 degrees. It's, it's come from pretty deep down and it, it's gone through rocks similar to the ones we've drilled. So we can look at what's going on in there and we can uh, hopefully make better constraints on what's going on underneath Lost City and where the hydrogen and methane that are found in Lost City hydrothermal field are coming from. Oh, exciting stuff. And is that your particular area? Is that what excites you, the, the potential origins of life? Uh, no, it's not really my field at all. <laughs> <laughs> so the way that this whole thing started, I, I'm more of a petrologist and structural geologist, if you like, a, a geochemist to some extent. So I, I worked for a long time on, on shear zones in the Pyrenees. So I was a, an on-land geologist. And then I moved to kind of fault rocks in the ocean. So my interest in the Atlantis Massif has been historically mainly in the fault that exposed these prototypes and also gabbroic rocks, which are the lower crustal rocks. But uh, going back to what you asked about my expertise, so the, the process of getting an expedition approved is quite a long one. And it started in 2018. And I just got together with my, mainly with my petrological friends and said, why don't we drill a deeper hole in the Atlantis Massif? That would be interesting. And so we put together this proposal, deepening hole 1309D was its first thing, which is what the original intention was. This is that hole in the uh, five kilometers away in the Gabbro. And so we were going to deepen that and we we're going to get down to places where the temperature was about over, over 200 degrees and look at reactions between water and rock that were going on down there. And, uh, and then uh, it, I realized that when you're getting one of these international expeditions funded, you need to have as broad a coalition of people as possible. And obviously I was interested in Lost City and, and I, I'd been a co, co-proponent of a, another expedition, 357, which would draw shallow holes in the vicinity of Lost City. And so I said, oh, well, why don't we, you know, we weren't going to put microbiology in because our hole was going to start at 1,040 degrees above the little ice. Yeah, supposedly beyond. Yes. So we thought, well, the microbiologists weren't very, very interested in that. But what we did do, we said, well, well, we'll sample waters in it. And the water in that deep hole, which we did sample, that has this whole temperature gradient. So the microbiologists are interested in that, in the microbes that might be in the water. 
in a hole that was let been undisturbed for 13 years or so. But then we introduced this extra hole and we never expected it to get below 200 meters because that was the, the deepest anyone had got before. But we, we brought the microbiologists because they were very interested in the rocks from that, from the, the, the spentonized prototype rocks to get more, more of those rocks. And, and the way the, the science was written was that I found co-proponents, Beth Orcutt in, in particular, who, who helped with the microbiology description and Susan Lang, who's the other co-chief on the organic geochemistry side of of the proposal so we i don't make this proposal by being an expert in everything i i know about the structural geology and things i can write all that but i get other people to collaborate who can do this so it's a completely multidisciplinary international team 25 20 26 scientists all from different countries all over the world japan china india australia germany france america and britain so those are the all the countries that we had scientists on the expedition so um, I think this IODP is an exemplary program in this sense because all the data is free of access uh, after a year of moratorium. So anyone can go and inter- interact with that. They can go and collect samples and so on. This, this is a nice sort of nexus point over a few of our previous episodes. We, we spoke with Mandy Joy about the, the deep biosphere and the sort of theory of how, how deep life goes and how much there is. And we even spoke to Kevin Hand about potential life on the ice moons and uh, how much it felt like a deep sea habitat really and even discussing that if you transplanted a, a hadal amphipod to uh, enceladus's ocean it might starve rather than die immediately <laughs> it might live long enough yeah. to run out of food it might yes so uh, i mean we are um, generating food for the microbes in lost city and in the and potentially in the rock because what do they need well they can't rely on photosynthesis because there's no light so they're chemosynthetic bacteria. They rely on chemical reactions to give them energy. We live off carbon, which is, is generated by microbial and, and biological activity. We eat plants, we eat animals. It's fixed into a form we can use it. it yes, um, we don't try and get our carbon directly from carbon dioxide. But in the bottom of the ocean, they need to get their carbon from somewhere else. Now, of course, once you've got some microbes, then new microbes can eat the old microbes and so on. But uh, in the early days of, of life, they had to be capable of getting their carbon from abiotic sources. So people are very interested in the microbes that still do that. There was a record of previous microbial life as well, isn't there? That not just what's extant right now and, and living, but there were, there were records of both the Earth's previous climate and, um, and life, wasn't there? Well, we, we can find in, in rocks, you know, three billion year old rocks, we can find stromatolites, which are microbial mats. I'm getting out of my comfort zone now, but uh, you can certainly go back a, a reasonable way. And then uh, some of the microbiologists in our ship, they don't look at the microbes themselves. They, they look at, at the fossil microbes, if you like, the organic matter that's left, and they, they do DNA sequencing on it. So we had interesting different microbiologists. We had uh, Gordon Sutherland. He's very interested in living microbes. He was finding microbes that were living off bits of the inside of the drill string, which is meth. <laughs> They were growing from iron oxidation, rusting basically metal in seawater. And we have Feng Ping Wang, who's from China, and she's a very famous microbiologist. You can look her up on Wikipedia. And she specializes in culturing in the laboratory. So she's doing these things right at the limit of life, culturing them for many years, and then seeing, well, okay, these microbes here have survived at temperature x if i put them in temperature x minus 20 then they grow and she collected lots of specimens which she's put into little pressure vessels and taken back to china to to do these experiments in her lab so a very very interesting set of people yeah really broad team yeah exactly yeah so doing this required some old technology and some very new technology you mentioned you sort of revisiting a hole that was bored previously and it was bored quite a long time ago wasn't it was it about 20 years uh, yes in 2004 five we were there over Christmas and New Year. So yes, that was it's been there for a long time. And what we do with these holes, we put what's called a re-entry cone onto the top. There's a re-entry cone and some casing, which just protects the top of the hole from bits of rock falling into the bottom. And so we'd put this re-entry cone in back in 2005, and it, it's still there now, and we were able to re-enter it. And then we've left this new hole with a, a re-entry cone as well. So that means that that hole 1309D, it was re-entered after seven years, by an expedition called 340T, which was just a, a logging expedition and temperature measurement. So they just lowered um, geophysical instruments down the hole with the drilling ship. They, they did logging with the drilling ship inside the hole and uh, measured the temperature, which was really in- very uh, interesting. And then it was left for another 13 years, and we went back and, and, and went back into it and sampled water in the hole to see whether, whether in the intervening 13 years since it was last disturbed, we'd had reactions going on between water and the rock in the deepest parts of the hole. And uh, we measured the temperature gradient again, and then we did deepen the hole by another 80 meters and we got some rock 
from down the bottom there as well, uh, including some samples from microbiologists so they can prove there's no life at 140 degrees centigrade. It's something that's just very easily said, you know, we, we really entered a hole that we had previously drilled. But these are, what, over 2,000 metres deep? You're on a moving platform, but way above them? You know, how on earth is that achieved? Well, basically, we know the latitude longitude of the hole, and we take the ship to that latitude and longitude. And then the, the ship, the Geordie's Resolution, I mean, it, like all drilling ships, actually, it's, it's, it's a 50-year-old drilling ship. So in, in drilling ship terms, it's pretty old tech. You know, you can go on a tour around and you can go in the shack where they control the drilling. And it's got, you know, knobs and dials and things like that. You know, the, those old school things that we used to have on instruments. Oh, and then they've got a crew of about five guys who are tripping the pipe, which I'll come to in a minute. So it's a, quite a labor intensive thing. Well, now on a modern oil field drilling ship, it's all pretty much robotic and it's all controlled from a, a dedicated computer in some place not, not very near the uh, drill floor. No one's getting muddy and wet. Uh, no, no, exactly. Only if they have to fix something. But anyway, how do we find the hole? Okay, well, what we have to do is we don't have any submersible thing that can get, we don't have a, an ROV that can go down there and look for it. What we do is we just sit there on the, on the top of the seat and we trip the pipe. And that means that we, we put a 30 meter length of pipe. We, we first prepare, the, the guys first prepare the drill bit and the, what's called the bottom hole assembly. So it's a drill bit that's about a foot across, but it's got this about six and a half centimetre hole in the middle, which is where the core comes up. So it's like a drill bit which can drill a hole in the rock, leaving a, a sort of column of rock that pokes up through it. And then it's got this, this a, a bunch of rather heavy bits of pipe that give it a bit of weight near the bottom. And then above that, this is drill string, which is wider than the piece of rock, and it's in 30 metre lengths. So they basically lower what's there already down get hold of it, use the derrick and a crane and so on that's all organised to pick up another 30 metre length, screw that into the uh, what's there already, and then they drop that down 30 metres, grab hold of it again, put another 30 metres on. So we get down, the, the 1309D hole was actually at about 1,600 metres below the seafloor. So you can work out how many lengths of pipe they had to put in there. So uh, 50, 50 odd lengths of pipe <laughs> to get down there. And then when you've got down to the right depth, you send a camera down. So there's a frame that they can clip around the drill string and drop that through the moon pool. So in the middle of the ship, there's a big hole. That's called the moon pool. That's where the drill and the drill string and the camera and everything can go down through that. And you go down with this camera and just you can see the bit and you can see fish swimming around and things like this. And then they just look around for the um, cone sticking up. So it's basically you go down there, you do a camera survey, which means you just say, OK, we, we think we're in the right place here. But we'll just sort of spiral our way out. We'll go, go up, up a bit, sideways a bit, down a bit, sideways until we see the drill coder. And it, the first time we entered, it took about an hour, perhaps, to find it. Really impressive. And we're talking about something which is like two metres across here at 1,600 metres depth. And, and there's no very high tech in doing this. You know, well, I mean, there's there's GPS positioning. Uh, the ship has dynamic positioning, which means it has a set of thrusters that can keep it on station if the wind's blowing and so on. I'm guessing there's a USB-L on the, on the end, so you know where the, the bit is relative to the ship? Um, not really. Really? We assume it's directly below, but if there's a current, it won't be directly below. The drill string, you know, it has a certain amount of flex in it. And, uh, I mean, obviously, we have a fiber optic link to the camera, that's the only electronics we have at the bottom of the, the drill string. Um, we were able to collect bottom water samples by a, a bottle on the drill string as well, which was triggered electronically. But uh, otherwise, it's not very high tech at all, really. Oh, is the drill bit itself hydraulic? The, the drill bit, the drill, no, the drill bit is turned from the top. Oh, right. OK. It is possible to have a drill bit that is turned by a so-called mud motor at the bottom. And, uh, and, and we did have that technology to try and install a re-entry cone, which actually failed in the end, and then we tried a different way. But in terms of finding the bit itself, once we got into the hole, then we need to trip that pipe another 1,400 metres. So that's another process, several hours of tripping the pipe to get down to 1,400 metres. And then we turn the whole drill string from a motor in the derrick at the top of the ship. So the, the drilling is, is controlled from the ship. And, uh -huh. uh, and then we're able to sample the core. What, what we do is we put a, a, what's called a core barrel, which is basically a plastic tube. We drop that down through the drill string and it just sort of latches itself right at the bottom, just above the drill bit. And then as you drill down, the core kind of comes up into that barrel. And then when you've got five meters of core, 
and you drilled five meters down. Then you can send a latch key, if you like. You drop that down the drill pipe, and that has to be done from right at the top of the derrick. So there's one of the drillers hoists himself up in a harness. With a five meter drain pipe. Puts this into the top of the pipe. It drops down to the bottom on the end of a cable, which is onto the thing. And then we can pull that up again on that cable. We don't have to keep changing the bit in order to recover core, but every few days, the bit wears out and we have to, to trip all the pipe right back onto the ship again, change the bit on the ship and then trip it right and put it right down again. So it's typically three to five days of, of wear on the bit and we have to change it. Wow. But uh, we, can, we, we were getting core, five metres of core in 1601C every hour and a quarter. So every hour and a quarter, a new set of core would come up for the core describers to describe. So they had a, a lot of work to do. Yeah, that's loads of material. That's, that's quicker progress than I had in my mind. Uh, well, we, we were very surprised at the progress we got in this hole. I mean, in hole 1309D, we were going at about one meter an hour, 1.5 meters an hour. But in terms of drilling rate, we were up at five or six meters per hour. Uh, you know, in the one hour and a quarter, a lot of that was just sending the core barrel down and yeah. picking another length of core out. So it, it was, it was uh, remarkably quick and remarkably trouble-free drilling compared to expectations. Brilliant. So you weren't anticipating setting a new record. It just went extremely well. Well, we, we were hoping to set some records in hole 1309D, actually. So uh, we, we just failed by about five metres, or eight metres, to drill the deepest ever hole in Gabro. We got close to it, but we didn't. We, we decided when we got this such favourable drilling in 1601C that we preferred that hole. Oh, yeah, let's deepen this one because it's in the spent night. Mm. No one's done that before. So we weren't expecting to beat the 200 metre record for a hole in Spentonite's prototype, but we did. And the science part just said, oh, let's just keep drilling here. You know, this is really exciting. <laughs> don't, don't interrupt a good thing. No, exactly. So, yes, yeah, so we, we were expecting to set one or two records, but we set different records from the ones we expected to set. Uh, you've, got, you've got to be flexible at that. I spent years writing those, um, writing those grant proposals, but you've just got to roll with the punches when you're out there. <laughs> well, absolutely. And, and we, we had a few punches of other sorts. Can we talk about the sort of history of this project for a while and then maybe look into the future a little bit? Because the, the sort of idea of, a, of deep sea drilling sort of began in the 1960s and there was a very successful project during that time and then funding dried out and it, it, was, it was a project that was sort of well, a dream that was sort of left for, for a while and it was only quite recently sort of reinvigorated and there's, there's a bit of uncertainty going forward, isn't there? Yes, so it started as the deep sea drilling project there were quite a lot of aims of the deep sea drilling project, but one of the aims was to drill a moho, i.e. a hole through the moho. And the, the, the moho is the boundary between the crust and the mantle. So underneath uh, Britain or New Zealand, that's down at 30 kilometres or so. And, you know, out of reach of drilling, really. You know, the deepest hole, as I recall, is 14 kilometres from the Kola Peninsula up in northern Russia. And uh, there's been a couple of other deep holes as well in Germany and uh, one recently in China. So drilling a mohole in the Constance is still out of reach. The problem is, you know, it's very deep and it gets very hot as well. So the, the idea was, well, in the oceans, it's only six kilometres typically in the Pacific, say, the crust. So we can drill a mohole through this six kilometres and get into the mantle. And they tried a few times. So they, they tried it. Uh, the first real effort was a hole called 504B. And that was after, that was in the first, in the first eight days of ODP. So DSDP, Deep Sea Drilling Project. Then it became ODP. And then it became IODP. So the, the program started drilling holes in outcrops of, of spentonized prototype. And that's where we set a new record, not in the sense of the first hole into mantle rocks, maybe the 10th hole into mantle rocks that we've drilled, but we drilled, drilled by far the deepest and with the best recovery. So that, that's the, the, the big achievement that we did. And that aim, even in that expedition 304, 305, the expectation of geophysics and getting rocks from submersibles and dredging up underneath Lost City on the south wall of the massif was that we would drill into serpentinized prototype and then fresh prototype. And so that was the aim, actually, of Expeditions 304 and 305 back in 2004-05, was to drill a hole into fresh mantle rocks, because the geophysics suggested that. And unfortunately, the geophysics turned out to be a bit misleading, and we drilled a 1,400-metre hole in Gabbro, which is lower crustal rocks and not mantle rocks at all. So a lot of scientists on that expedition were rather disappointed. And so we effectively fulfilled the objective of that by drilling a hole into mantle rocks and, and spentonized ones. We didn't get into completely fresh rocks. Well, we certainly got rocks with about 50% altered, with plenty of olivine still left in them. So anyway, in terms of the programme, I mean, IODP was a 
a really valuable program. And one of the first things it did was, I think, on leg two or three back in the 60s, uh, they drilled a South Atlantic transect. So they drilled with the Glomar Challenger ship a transect of holes from the mid-ocean ridge in the South Atlantic away from that. And they basically proved that the age of the seafloor was progressively older as you went away from mid-Atlantic ridge. So this was a, a critical proof of plate tectonics because the idea of plate tectonics had just come around the idea that you had spreading ridges in the middle of the Atlantic and the Pacific where the new crust and new oceanic lithosphere was being generated in a continuous process and therefore as you went towards Africa or towards South America away from the center of the mid-Atlantic ridge the rocks should become older and older and they did so that was a really key thing but uh, now what's what's happened with the program is that the the Geordie's resolution as I say it's a 50 year old drilling ship and it's only got another five years of life in it before some environmental certificates and things run out completely. And we've known for, for, for a long time that, that this drill ship needed replacing in order to continue the programme. But of course, replacing this drilling ship is a, an expensive thing. And it, it's funded in America. It's an American ship funded by NSF, the, uh, the, you know, the research uh, council in America, covers all, all branches of scientific research. And the scientists from the IODP side had made proposals for a new ship, ooh, I don't know, six, seven years ago. And this kept being cut into the long grass by NSF, you know, oh, yeah, we'll decide that later. And then we had expected, uh, you know, back in uh, February, the expectation was that the programme would be renewed for another four years. We'd have another four years of use of the Geology's resolution. But we had this rather bombshell announcement in the pages of Nature uh, back in March this year, which said that the NSF had decided that they were not going to continue the programme. And that's how you found out? That's basically how everyone involved in IODP found out. Even oh. the, the people in College Station who run the thing didn't know. It seems like the, the programme has consistently, I mean, I'm sure it's expensive, but it seems like it's consistently delivered quite groundbreaking results. Yes. Well, it, it's uh, $70 million a year, the existing programme costs. And that was a pressurized version of one of our longer episodes. If you enjoyed that and you would like to hear the full length episode, just match the episode numbers and you'll be able to find the full length version in the feed. Thanks for listening. We'll deep see you next time. And I abyss you already. You're on the ride with the